sewage is dirty, but interesting, and a potentially useful early warning system in a pandemic. A pilot project in Germany is working out just how useful. In India, the pandemic has led people to grow more of their food locally. Why? We'll sink our teeth into that question later in this COVID-19 special. But right now, come with us to the Republic of Congo, where researchers are studying the lives of gorillas. In the current pandemic, there's a risk that people will infect the great apes. It is five o'clock in the morning and Rabi Bukaka is already trekking through the Congolese jungle. Early mornings are the best time for the young environmental scientist to search for and study the gorillas. After a one-hour trek, he spots some. Under strict precautions, he tries to observe them, study their behaviour. The mask is to avoid contamination, airborne contamination with the gorillas. With coronavirus, it's important that we protect the animals against the disease because we know that when the disease migrates from humans to animals and then possibly back to humans, it gets very complicated. The north of Congo Brazzaville is home to the western lowland gorillas. Thousands live here. Nowhere else in the world can you find such a density of gorillas. How dangerous is COVID-19 for them? That's a question Rabi Bukaka and his research group often debate, but they simply don't have an answer yet. After a silverback got seriously sick with COVID in a US zoo, they've been very careful. They keep at least 25 meters away from the gorillas and everyone here is vaccinated. In the early 2000s, Ebola killed almost 5,000 gorillas. That disease was most likely transmitted by bats, possibly from eating the same fruits. That's why Rabi Bukaka and a group of students from the University of Brazzaville are also researching the area's massive bat population. It's very important to follow up on bat pathogens because there's a local community that eats bats. And scientifically, we know that there's a risk of transferring disease from bats to humans. We need to know and avoid that kind of transmission and possibly also forecast what could become future diseases, like your future coronavirus. In the capital Brazzaville, there are several high-risk places for the spillover of diseases from animals to humans, bushmeat markets. While selling endangered species like gorillas and chimpanzees is illegal, many other varieties of bushmeat can be bought here. Rabi Bukaka can understand that local residents hunt and eat bushmeat to make a living. But he is opposed to bushmeat markets where he says endangered species are also often sold illegally. These are markets that can be considered breeding grounds for diseases. In those markets, viruses can be easily transferred from animals to humans. And when someone contracts the disease, it quickly spreads to others. It can easily escalate from epidemic to pandemic. That's the danger of those markets. To prevent future disease outbreaks among the gorillas, the scientists have increased surveillance, creating an early warning system. The research base is the core of the Congo Conservation Company, whose research is financed by ecotourism. It also creates employment for the community, encouraging participation in conservation efforts. But they want to keep the number of tourists low. We don't want to push on the gorillas too much, and also we don't want to have a, a kind of factory and like a lot of people coming in, coming in, coming in. We want to keep it uh, as pos calm as possible to be able uh, to manage that with the park and with the conservation aspects. We don't want mass tourism here. The Congo Basin is the second largest rainforest in the world, often referred to as the Earth's African lung. It absorbs more greenhouse gases than the entire continent emits. And it has a unique and diverse ecosystem. In the meantime, Rabi Bukaka is getting ready for his next trek to the gorillas. He has a few more weeks for his research here before returning to the capital to write his master's thesis. I think I'll never get tired of seeing the gorillas. For me, it's a dream. It's a dream to be here. 
To be able to go and see them is a dream. I can spend all day long watching them. For me, that's the life I want to live. Ravi Bukaka wants more Congolese to appreciate the environment and study natural sciences. In his master's course, there are currently only four students. Not far from Cape Town lies one of the leading lights of South Africa's academic world, Stellenbosch University. Here, a team of researchers is on the hunt for new virus variants. Late last year, they discovered the Omicron variant. This is the room where the Omicron variant of COVID was first discovered. Professor Tulio de Oliveira of Stellenbosch University in South Africa is leading a team conducting the genomic surveillance of deadly pathogens in a 100 million euro research facility. Of course, that a lot of the world got very surprised how South Africa can, can be a leader on genomic surveillance, but we, we were not surprised because we, we have been leading on genomic surveillance of other pathogens for the past 20 years. It was this experience that set South Africa apart from the rest of the globe's scientific community in isolating, identifying, and revealing Omicron. South Africa may be a middle-income country dealing with rampant unemployment, stubborn poverty, and one of the highest rates of inequality in the world. But its scientists are world leaders. They are leveraging the experience gained from over three decades of managing one of the globe's highest rates of HIV and AIDS to be among the first to discover the intricacies of COVID-19 and its variants. One thing that people don't realize is that in addition to the Omicron, we also detect the, the, the first variant was the beta and was with our tip and guidance that the United Kingdom identified the alpha. So in reality, we have helped to identify three of the five variants of concern. There was a hypothesis that a cluster of new COVID-19 infections in Johannesburg, South Africa's economic capital, were behaving differently than previous variants. He and his team worked around the clock to make the Omicron discovery, with hundreds of samples flown down to his lab overnight in mid-November 2021. We did everything from beginning to the end in 36 hours, which, which was a lot of pressure, but, but we, we, we had a very clear line of communication, and that was reviewed by all the top scientists in the world. And this was crucial because that's what allowed not only the world to understand that boosting against the Omicron would save lives. And that's what we did in South Africa. We had very small number of deaths on the Omicron wave. And we think that our very quick scientific results helped the world to also have a lower level of deaths. But the discovery did not come without its costs. South Africa's economy took an immediate hit as the government extended lockdown measures in response to the announcement while travel bans to and from the country were immediately imposed by the majority of the global community. And the team's lives were also put in immediate danger. We, we, we received many, many, many threats, many death threats. At a given time, we had to put like armed security in the entrance of the university because we could carry our work. And the big lesson to the world is that they should make mechanisms that don't penalize countries to identify new pathogens. Otherwise, we're going to have more and more epidemics and pandemics that, that are not identified early. The stress of Omicron's discovery has taken its toll. But Professor de Oliveira believes that as professional pressure increases, so should efforts to stay sane and healthy, both mentally and physically. So in order to relax in this kind of environment, yeah, 
you have to take almost every tool that we have in the kind of mental health uh, basket. Uh, so in our lab, we laugh a lot, we, we, we tell jokes, we play a lot. Yeah. I do a lot of exercise, especially in nature, long, long, long hikes in the mountains, go a lot to the beach. And also for me, um, meditation works well. Every morning I wake up around 5 a.m. and do a session of meditation before the day starts. After almost 30 years as a genome sequencer, Professor de Oliveira believes the future of his profession lies in computing. And that anybody who wants to follow in his footsteps needs to be dedicated and patient. The main advice to young people that want to become a, a scientist or a genomic scientist, yeah, is to, is to invest a lot of time, not only on the on learning the lab techniques, but learning uh, the coding, yeah, computer coding, yeah, software development, because these days, all the data that we produce in this lab is completely automated. And after 27 years in South Africa, he has no plans to move abroad, even though he may have been thrown into the global spotlight and his genomic surveillance skills are in high demand elsewhere. I always had a passion to work on science that can help to save lives. And South Africa and Africa is a great place from that. And that's why we devote a lot of our time to uh, working with science, but also inform governments on how better to respond to epidemics. Not only SARS-CoV-2, COVID, but also from other epidemics that, that cause millions of deaths. The coronavirus may have made Professor de Oliveira famous beyond the borders of South Africa, but he remains committed to his humble approach to solving some of the world's most pressing health problems. Do you have questions about the coronavirus? Our science journalist, Derek Williams, will answer them and bring you up to date with the latest research. Send them to govidproducer at dw.com. Sarosh Salim wants to know, have there been human challenge trials where vaccinated people were exposed to new variants? Human challenge trials, or HCTs, are trials where healthy test subjects are intentionally exposed to pathogens in a tightly controlled setting. Um, they're very useful when it comes to providing solid data on questions like uh, how much of a virus it takes to really make you sick, for instance, or, or how much protection vaccines really provide. Um, trying to figure out stuff like that from real-world data is tricky, and it involves making educated guesses. Um, HCTs can remove a lot of that guesswork, but of course, intentionally infecting volunteers with diseases that could take a serious or, or even a deadly turn is an ethical minefield. So HCTs are not entered into lightly. I'm aware of only one human challenge trial involving COVID-19 so far, um, which took place in 2021 in the UK. Um, in it, 36 healthy young adults had drops of fluid that contained a controlled amount of SARS-CoV-2 squirted into their noses. Um, half of them later tested positive for COVID-19, and 16 of them showed symptoms, none classified as serious, although Five of the subjects did continue to report problems with smell and taste um, six months later. The study helped clarify questions about, for instance, how quickly symptoms begin to develop post-infection and, and when viral load peaks. Um, but there was one major drawback. It's that the strain of virus used in the study was isolated from a patient quite early in the pandemic, so before SARS-CoV-2 began to seriously mutate. Um, since then, we've seen a series of new variants as the virus changed in, in pretty fundamental ways, becoming a whole lot more transmissible in the process. So although the study provided great data, it was 
pretty much outdated by the time the results were published. Um, new human challenge trials would have to more or less start all over using the variants that currently dominate the COVID-19 landscape. And then they'd likely be outdated in six months or so, which finally brings me to the answer to your question. Um, no, I couldn't find any HCTs in progress where vaccinated people were being exposed to new variants. And the reason why is that with the virus still mutating quickly and in unpredictable ways, uh, they just wouldn't make much sense. Reliable data are needed to respond quickly to a new coronavirus wave, and we can find that information in our sewers. A pilot project in Germany shows that monitoring our wastewater can give us useful information on the pandemic. The wastewater in the Ruhleben sewage treatment plant in Berlin comes from around 1 million people. The system processes almost 250,000 cubic metres a day. Imagine 1.3 million bathtubs filled to the brim. Berlin Waterworks' Astrid hackenesch rump believes what most people consider unpleasant and dirty can give valuable information about the coronavirus pandemic. The wastewater is really a gold mine for us, because not everyone goes to the test center, but everyone does go to the bathroom and ultimately provides data that we can use. That's because infected people excrete viruses when they go to the bathroom, long before they become ill themselves or infect others. So why not just see how much RNA, that is genetic information from viruses, arrives at the sewage treatment plant and how the numbers change? That could flag waves of infection. It's a very, very big mix. That was the problem at the beginning. First of all, we had to make sure that we removed all the other contaminants from the wastewater to really be able to isolate the RNA. It's working very well now, and the hope was that we'd be able to get a realistic picture of how the infection is spreading. Almost two years ago, Susanne Lackner of the University of Darmstadt found out that wastewater samples can be used to determine how quickly and how strongly the coronavirus is spreading in a region. At that time, she was in the laboratory looking for an early warning system for waves of coronavirus. She struck gold with the wastewater. The process caused a stir at the time in the Netherlands, in Spain and in the US. It's much cheaper than doing hundreds of thousands of individual coronavirus tests. Twenty German municipalities have been taking part in the wastewater monitoring pilot project since the end of last year. Significantly more have applied to be part of it. The Berlin Waterworks are also involved. Samples are taken twice a week at several sewage treatment plants in the German capital. The participants in the Germany-wide pilot test then send the samples to a laboratory for analysis. In order to get results as quickly as possible, Berlin Waterworks even bought their own analysis device. Laboratory head Uta Böckelmann says that she was able to predict every single wave at the beginning of the year, when the number of infections in Germany rose rapidly. We're kind of not just a monitoring service, we're kind of an early warning system and can really predict a wave and when it's coming in the wastewater. Using the data from around the end of last year, Uta Böckelmann shows that the wastewater analysis delivers results 10 to 14 days faster than the incidence figures based on individual PCR tests. You can see blue spikes here. This is the data we processed from the PCR machine in RNA copies per liter. If I click here now, here we had 1.5 million virus particles per liter of wastewater. And now if you pay attention to the green line, the green line is the incidence number of the human samples. And so you can see the green peak always lags behind the blue spikes. And when viewed over a longer period of time, the peaks in the blue wastewater data can be seen earlier than the incidences which are based on individual PCR tests. What's more, the laboratory can also determine which virus variants are represented and to what extent. One could therefore react quickly if a more dangerous variant began to prevail over less harmful variants. 
Well, I'd say that it definitely makes sense to go beyond the pilot phase and make this part of the routine, and not just for controlling coronaviruses, but also, for example, influenza viruses, polio viruses, and gastrointestinal tract viruses. You set up a wastewater monitoring system to get an overview. What's going on with it now? What infections should we expect? The pilot program will soon be completed. Now the German authorities have to agree to nationwide wastewater monitoring. It shouldn't be about the money. For around 500 euros, you can get insights into a reliable trend of infection development for hundreds of thousands of people very early on, just by looking at the wastewater. Agriculture uses a lot of water. But as a result of the pandemic, projects in the Indian state of Kerala are increasingly relying on local cultivation. Technology allows the scarce water available for urban farming to be used more efficiently. It's planting season, and Vijay Kumar Das is placing green chili peppers into the soil. The plastic sheeting traps the moisture inside. He has worked as a farmer for six years. Vijay Das is originally from rural Assam in northern India, but he has learned these farming techniques here in the city of Thiruvan Anthapuram in Kerala on the southwestern coast. I used to just help my dad before I came here. But now, I've learned a lot about farming and about the technology. No matter where I go, I don't have to worry. No one has to tell me what to do, since I already know. Vijay Das works for Grün Agro Ventures, a small company on the city's outskirts. It provides farming and technical training to people to set up farms on unused urban land. Launched in 2016, the company integrates technology with traditional farming practices, such as growing vegetables adapted to the soil and using only natural pesticides. Founder Ejaz Salim wants to get more city dwellers to grow their own food, to better cope with future shortages. During the pandemic, the exposure to local produce was far greater than before, simply because of the fact that your resources were limited. So that has changed the palate tremendously, and that single aspect is what I believe will be the future driver of this business. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, Thiruvan Anthapuram, like other Kerelan cities, imported most of its food from neighboring Tamil Nadu. But the imported vegetables were often heavily contaminated with chemicals. That's why the state is now promoting urban rooftop farming. More than 20,000 people are already taking part in the program. Urban agriculture could be a sustainable solution to feed growing populations and rapidly urbanizing India. But unlike in Kerala, scaling up could be a challenge, especially in major cities like Delhi, Bengaluru and Chennai, all of which are running dangerously low on groundwater levels. But experts say there could be a solution. Unlike the uh, earlier conventional method of irrigating plants using a pot or maybe a hose, uh, now we have micro-irrigation methods, like micro-sprinklers are there, then uh, drip irrigation is there. The government is supporting those programs also. And there are a number of uh, private companies also bringing out good models that can be fitted into this. So that water shortage pro problem can be uh, solved to a great extent. Urban farming also creates a green buffer against carbon emissions and helps to filter air pollution. But a lot of people living in cities can't afford the fresh homegrown food. The Helping Hands organization supports people with autism from low-income families. With the help of Grün Agro, it converted an acre of arid land on its lot into a vegetable patch. The autistic people learn everything about farming and can take their harvest home. Working with them on the land, the organization discovered that farming also has therapeutic value. 
they are actually acquiring skill set like you know uh, team building skill set and the way they are you know working together while they harvest so understanding the concept and acquiring certain skill set and uh, communication and other areas uh, farming is really helpful Ajah Salim mainly sells the vegetables to middle and upper middle class families in Kerala. Now he hopes to reach even more people and promote the benefits of urban farming by setting up a co-working space in the middle of the farm. This work from farm initiative lets people do their office work surrounded by greenery and even raise their own vegetables if they wish. We would like to have people come over here as a regular way of life understand as to how farming is and create that farm connect and bond so that they are able to nurture in their minds you know a dream of a future farm it's working in kerala where more and more people are turning to urban agriculture and vj kumar das has long hoped to set up his own vegetable farm in his home state of assam that was the COVID-19 special for another week. Thanks for watching and see you next time.